praise the Lord. Before we hear the preach of God's word today, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day which thou hast made, that may rejoice and be glad in it, giving thanks unto thee, for thou art good, for thy mercy endureth forever. For we have tasted and seen that thou art good, and that blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. For it is thy goodness, O Lord, which leadeth us unto repentance. Thou art a great God, and a great King above all gods. Thou art great, and greatly to be praised, and thy greatness, O Lord, is unsearchable. Heavenly Father, we thank thee that may know thee, for they that know thee should be strong to exploits, and may know thee by thy word. Thy word which proceedeth out of thy mouth, has man shall not labor but alone, but every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth. For as newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby may grow thereby. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but thy word, O Lord, shall be forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before you hear the preaching of God's word, I'd like to give a testimony from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 11. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 11. And this here, of course, all the Bible is important, but this answers it all about what? Timing. It's all about the right timing. Again, it is written, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. It's all about the timing. Many professing Christians miss the will of God because they miss the timing. God may call them to do something, but they do it at the wrong time and miss God's timing. For instance, back in 1995, I was just born again. And as I was just born again and, and trying to figure out what God wanted me to do and, and figure out the will of God here in a heathen country where the church was very weak, but praise God for the word of God. And as I would spend hours in God's word, the Lord would show me at a certain intersection called the Ratchapasong intersection here in Bangkok, Thailand, where there's a shrine to Brahma. In English, they call it the Erwan Shrine. It's a shrine to Brahma of a once hotel that no longer exists there where many workers had died and they built this big shrine. But after in the 1980s, they destroyed that hotel. They still kept the shrine there and it became a very popular place. And the Lord showed me back in 1905 to go to that street corner and to preach the gospel. And I would go there, but yet I wouldn't know how to preach. Well, I did. The Lord showed me how to do it, but I just wasn't sure if I should just start preaching like that. And I would, what they call witness to people one-on-one -on -one and preach to people one-on-one -on -one and go back to where we're living the time completely defeated so I know what God had called me to do. Years later, praise the Lord, got in the will of God, began preaching the gospel, but no longer the Lord called me to the Ratchapotsong intersection. Why? It's a complete different place now. They built up a wall. It's no longer open with all the people like before. It's not like it was. I can't use what God called me to do in 1995 now. It would be the wrong timing. It's all about the timing. Right now, we're still going through the pandemic. There is still a mutation of COVID-19 here in Thailand, and they still require us to wear these face masks outside. And they require us not to speak out loud outside and try to avoid crowds of people and only do essential things together at this time. If we were to go and preach the gospel that we've done for over 20 years at this time, it would not be a witness to others. Because in their mindset, if we were preaching the gospel this time, in their mindset, do their propaganda, whether they're right or wrong, I could argue that, in their mindset, we'd be like the person at the dinner table who sneezes all over the food. 
That is so they think of people who are speaking out loud or taking off a face mask. You could do so, and they'll probably let you get away with it, especially for some of you that's a non tie. But in their mindset, you're like the guy coughing over the food. That's how they think about at this time when COVID-19 and there's certain mutation that's still going around at this time. It's all about the timing. You can't do what God called you to do yesterday, today. You've got to do what God called you to do today, today. It's all about the timing. Now, back when I was a prying spider, nobody believed me. And then when I became a preacher, everybody believed I was a prying spider because my body changed. But back when I was a prying spider, I was very tall and skinny. And people didn't believe I was a prying spider. But how was it I was successful in the ring? I didn't have the muscles. I didn't have come from the farmlands that most of the ties, 95% of the Thai boxers came from, coming from those farmlands, made them strong and tough. They were working in the fields all day their whole life. And how was it I was going to compete with them and even beat them back in those days? Because of the timing, as I've testified about many of times, because I used the timing. And here in the way they prize fight, where they swing their shins and their kick, which they call a Wong Kang, and he was to call a round kick. That's not correct. They're swinging their shins and their kick, using the whole hip and whole body. For us, they use timing. When a Thai boxer just swings their shin at us, it's the same thing as telephoning us. Brum, brum, brum. Hello, I'm going to kick you. Because in the Thai version of prize fighting, they swing their whole body. And if you have the right timing, you can see it coming a mile away. It's like they're announcing it. It's like they're phone calling you. And if you straight kicks on them, it connects every time. And that's why I was in a fight on Thai TV, because I fight in what we call Nina Smokers. I, a Thai boxer got his ribs broken, and they thought my kick did it. Had nothing to my kick. I timed it. He fell, landed on his elbow, broke his ribs, and everybody thought my kick did it. And that's when they began promoting me and getting me on TV because of the timing. It's all about timing. When it comes to serving the Lord, it's all about the timing. When it comes to God's blessings, it's all about the timing. And so this past Tuesday evening, we had finished our last can of sardines. People, when they think of us living by faith, they think we live by sardines and crackers. Wrong. We just live by sardines. Crackers are a luxury. <laughs> People have, you know, many years ago, they said about me living off of sardines and crackers. Wrong. Crackers are a luxury. We live off the sardines. And so this past Tuesday evening, our last, we ate our last can of sardines. That was our meal this past Tuesday evening, a can of sardines. And we finished it, praise the Lord. And shortly after finishing that last can of sardines for dinner, shortly thereafter, a blessing came in. Nobody knew. We never told anybody. We don't ask. We don't beg. We don't hit. Nobody knew of our needs. We let all requests be known to God. As the Bible says, be careful for nothing, but let your requests be made known unto God. And as we did so, not tell anybody else, it was the timing of that blessing. We finished our last sardine, can of sardines, on Tuesday evening. And shortly thereafter, right after that, shortly thereafter, we received a message that a blessing arrived to our Thai bank account. And of course, we weren't full on Tuesday evening. But it was such a blessing to know a blessing had arrived. We could be content with that last can of sardines, praise God, knowing a blessing had arrived, and now we can buy food the next day. Praise the Lord. And then yesterday, there's a sister in Christ, and years ago she believed that she was one of Elijah's ravens that God used to take care of Elijah. And she has confessed that she believes God's called her to be one of Elijah's ravens, and would bless us, praise the Lord, as the ravens bless Elijah. So yesterday afternoon, the late afternoon time, a parrot flew to our, there's 444 rooms in this building of 22 floors. And of all the rooms, yesterday afternoon, a parrot came to our room and called us to it. And there it was on our balcony. And it allowed us to feed it some cashew nuts we had. And the parrot ate those nuts 
and stayed there and we tried communicating with it and it stayed there for quite a while and then eventually it left wherever it lives and left us that was a blessing and then shortly after that again it's all about the timing that sister in Christ who is what she calls one of Elijah's ravens came to visit us with much needed groceries so praise the Lord we had good food last night we had a great meal of what they call the Thai Tung Nam Pik that is chili paste and with the vegetables and the rice and the eggs which is one of our favorite meals what we live off here here in Thailand and it was a blessing because not only God sent a parrot to visit us God also sent one of his ravens to bless us as well and again it's all about the timing praise the Lord that sister in Christ had no idea that the night previous we had just finished our last can of sardines. She had no idea we had no more food left. But she came the next day. She had no idea. We didn't tell her anything. She came on her own accord freely, willingly, and joyfully with groceries to bless us with. And the timing is what makes it a blessing. It's all about timing. As we see throughout the Bible, God is a God of time. Everything is done in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. If confusion is the opposite of peace, God is the God of order. When Moses asked what the Lord's name was, the Lord replied that he is the I am that I am. He is the God of now. He is not the God of yesterday. You can't do yesterday's commandments and think God's going to bless you. You cannot do what God calls you yesterday, today, and think God's going to bless you. You've got to do what God's called you to do now. He is the God of now, the I am that I am. And when you're in his timing, everything works out perfectly because he's a God of order. He is a God of timing, and everything falls on his timing. And that's the blessing of God's blessings arriving on his time which is always the right time praise the lord let's return about the book of matthew chapter 24. in the book of matthew chapter 24 once again in matthew chapter 24 the lord jesus christ answering three different questions what are those questions that christ is answering verse 3 and he, the Lord Jesus Christ, said upon the mount of the of his came and him privately, saying, Tell us when these things shall be. What things? The temple being destroyed. That has been fulfilled in 70 A.D. And in Matthew chapter 24, this is where so much confusion comes in, some of the scriptures in Matthew chapter 24 has already been fulfilled. But he answers three questions. That's the first one that's been fulfilled. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Christ has not come yet. Those scriptures are not yet fulfilled. The Lord is coming. He is coming again soon. He's coming again much sooner than yesterday. <laughs> no man knows the day or the hour, as the Bible says. But we know one thing, we're closer to Christ appearing today than we were yesterday. Every day we're getting closer to the Lord's coming again. He shall come again. That's the second question the Lord is answering, and that's found here in Matthew chapter 24, and those verses of scriptures have yet to be fulfilled. And the third question is, and of the end of the world. The coming of Christ and the end of the world are two separate events. Christ comes first, takes his church away first, then the world is judged after that, and then it's the end of the world. Christ does not come to take his church at the end of the world. That is a false teaching. There's people that believe that. Christ takes his church first. 
then there's judgment on this world, then there is the end of the world. So there are the three questions that the Lord is answering here at Matthew chapter 24. And in regards to his coming again, the Lord answers in verse 4, and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So we see very clearly, before Christ comes again, there shall be much deception in the name of Jesus Christ, many deceivers coming in his name, and they shall deceive many. And today, everywhere we look, Christians are being deceived right and left. Today, so many preachers are deceivers, it's hard to listen to preachers today because there's so many deceivers today. In fact, deceiving preachers are more the norm than preachers preaching the truth today, showing to us we're living in the last days, in the end times, where there is much deception. But Christ gives to us a command. Take heed that no man deceive you. You are without excuse if you're deceived. You can't say, well, that's what my church taught. I was just submitting to my church. That's no excuse when you stand for the Lord. You can't say, well, that's what my pastor taught. I was just following my pastor. You see, there's many which we call churchians. They place their faith in the church and not in the Lord. We are Christians. Our faith is in the Lord, not in man. Therefore, we call ourselves Christians. Our faith is in Christ. There's many out there today who are churchians. Their faith is in their church. Their faith is in their denomination. Their faith is in their church group, whatever kind of group it is. And churchians believe that God will give them a pass, though they may be deceived by their church, though their pastor may deceive them, they think God's going to overlook that and look at their faithfulness to the church. You are deceived, but you are so faithful to your church and so faithful to your denomination, I'm going to give you a pass. You're okay. You didn't know any better. That's not the way God is. God's not a heavenly mommy. He is a heavenly father. And the Lord has given us a command, take heed that no man deceive you. You have to be on guard to make sure nobody deceives you, even if they come in the name of the Lord. This is a command for Christians in the last days to not be deceived. Now we can learn from the Word of God. We can follow the examples here in God's Word out of Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, let us hear the Apostle Paul, written here by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, what he preached in Acts chapter 20 in verse 28. He is speaking to a church, not a church building, not a church denomination, a group of Christians, the people of God. These are Christians that were born again. These are Christians that were spirit-filled. These were Christians in Ephesus. The Bible calls them even disciples. They were not just believers. They were followers of Jesus Christ. And the apostle warns them in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now when Paul spoke this, how did he do it? Was it a side issue? Was it, by the way, just in case, was it like that? No. This was so serious to the apostle in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, the apostle says, therefore watch. That means be on guard against deceivers. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. The same apostle who wrote under the inspiration of the ghost to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. This rejoicing apostle who wrote under the inspiration of the ghost in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This same thankful, rejoicing apostle for three years, when it came to this subject, he did it with tears. And it was something he spoke about three years without ceasing. It means 
This is all he talked about. If you don't know what it was like to be at the Apostle Paul for three years, this is all he talked about, deceivers. And he did it with tears coming out of his eyes. What kind of deceivers? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore to yourselves, all the flock which the Holy Ghost made Jehovah's ears, to feed the church of God, which hath purchased his own blood. Why? Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing, after the apostle of all leaves, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves. Whose selves? The church in Ephesus. But not just the church in Ephesus. This one, the church built a church organization. The church here was born-again Christians, spirit-filled Christians. Of their own selves, the apostle called them what? The church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. From the blood-bought church of God. A church, a group of people, not a building, not an organization, not a denomination, a group of people in Ephesus that were blood-bought. A group of people in Ephesus that belonged to God, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. This group in Ephesus of people that are blood-bought, these were redeemed, born-again Christians, covered in the blood of Jesus, in whom the blood of Jesus cleansed them from all of their sins, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, from the blood-bought church, from their own selves, shall arise what? Verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone, night and day with tears. What does this show us? This shows us that in the blood-bought, spirit-filled church of God, the deceivers can arise. This shows us the heresy of once saved, always saved is a heresy. You know, I have never met a once saved, always saved Christian in action. I've met many that claim to be once saved, always saved. For instance, back in the year 2001, I joined with the Independent Baptists, and they all believe in eternal security, or once saved, always saved, eternal security. Why did I join them? Because they were very evangelistic going up preaching the gospel, so they claim they're doing, going up preaching the gospel, so I joined with them to preach the gospel with them, because, praise God, God doesn't use lone rangers, no man's unto himself, and it's a blessing to preach with others. And this group of Christians, independent Baptists, boasted that they were preachers of the gospel, that they believed in Christ's great commission, and in 2001, what a blessing here, so we joined with them. They also believed in eternal security, once saved, always saved. And after a short time, they kicked me out of their denomination because I do not believe in what save, always save. Now, when they received me, they allowed me to preach in the pulpits. They loved my testimony. They even called me John the Baptist back then. That's how much they loved me. At their camp, for they've been a Baptist, in a camp in Chiang Rai, Thailand, and the camp site was called the Trail of Blood, they invited me as the guest preacher at the camp. And I did all the preaching there, and they all received me. They heard my testimony. They believed that I was born again. They believed I was a Christian. There's no doubt whatsoever I was saved and born again. But because I did not believe once saved, always saved, guess what they believed about me? They believed I lost my salvation and kicked me out of the denomination, and they even told me I was going to hell. Now, they claim they believe once saved, always saved, right? They claim that once you're saved, you're always saved. And there's nothing you do that will lose your salvation. But yet, when they received me as a saved Christian, allowed me to preach their pulpits, received me as a brother in Christ, but when they found out I did not believe in this doctrine of eternal security, once they've always saved, not only they kicked me out of their church and out of their denominations, they said I was going to hell. That means they don't believe in what's saved, always saved. They claim they do, but they don't. I have preached at many churches that claim to believe in what's saved, always saved. And then when I preach, say, for instance, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, and they would hear that kind of preaching, they would say, I'm no longer saved. They would say, though they received me for years, preaching from their pulpit once a month, inviting me all the guests preaching, all the camps, all their cheats, all their revivals, 
But yet when I preached against the sin that they were doing, they claimed I was no longer saved anymore. I was on my way to hell, teaching false, and they kicked me out. Therefore, by action, they don't believe once saved, always saved. I have yet to meet Christians who believe once saved, always saved in action. There is no such thing. Because amongst once saved, always saved Christians, whatever the denomination may be, whether it be Baptists, Southern Baptists, Presbyterians, Christian Missionary Alliance, whatever denomination may be, they have people they know that have completely backslidden, gone back into idol worship, gone into sins such as sodomy and homosexuality, drugs and drunkenness, and they know those people have backslid and are going to hell. And from their own churches, they know there is people that have backslid. They may say, well, he wasn't really saved. That's why he backslid. No, you received them before saved. They were just as saved as you. They got saved the same way you did, but they backslid. And you know they're going to hell. Therefore, there is no churches that believe and once saved, always saved, that may claim it in action. That's not what they believe. And here in Acts chapter 20, we see very clearly that from the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, verse 28, the church of God which hath purchased with his own blood, verse 31, verse 30, of your own selves shall men arise from the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Every doctrine in the Bible has an example. God does not just give us words. Action speaks louder than words. Faith without works is dead. The Bible has examples. The Bible gives us examples of all the doctrines we believe in. That's why we believe the doctrines we believe by looking at the examples found here in the Word of God. Here the Apostle warns them that from their own selves, the blood-bought church of Christ, shall men arise, be in verse things, to draw away disciples after them. We have an example in Acts chapter 7. In the book of the Acts, the Apostles, chapter 7. Start with that. Chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1, a dispute arose in the church. And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglecting the daily administration. What did the apostles do? Stop your murmuring, stop speaking out. No. What did they do? Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them, and said, Is that reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of, number one, honest report. Each of these men had an honest report. Number two, full of the Holy Ghost. Not only were they born of God's Spirit, these seven men were also filled with the Spirit of God. Now again, there are professing Christians out there that do not believe in being filled with the Spirit of God. There's Christians out there that believe that when you're born again, that's it. There's no more work of the Holy Ghost. That's all there is to it. No. After you're born of God's Spirit, you can also be filled with the Spirit of God, and it's your choice. To be full of God's Spirit or not is up to you. So here that you seven men that are honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, not just knowledge, they needed wisdom how to apply that knowledge and wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this business, but we, that is the twelve, will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Parcharus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they sent for the apostles, and when they had prayed, 
they laid their hands on them. These seven men, including Nicholas, not only the apostles pray over them with the laying of hands, they were of honest report, they were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and served the Lord. This man, Nicholas, was born of God's Spirit, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, of an honest report. The apostles not only gave him the right hand of fellowship, even laid hands upon them and prayed for them and appointed them to this business in the church. Yet, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, we read of what happened to Nicholas. In the book of the Revelation, chapter 2. Revelation, chapter 2. In verse 6, the Lord reproves this church of Ephesus. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicholas had a set of followers. They called themselves the Nicolaitans. Nicholas was their leader. How do we know this is speaking of Nicholas from Acts chapter 6? Was it Acts chapter 6? Acts chapter 7? Acts chapter 6, how do we know it's to say Nicholas? Because of the early church, especially Arrhenius, who taught very big, big works against what we call today the Gnostics. And he also taught who the Nicolaitans were and who was their leader and what became of them. And because Arrhenius was the disciple of Polycarp, who was the disciple of the apostle John, we gotta give heed to what Arrhenius says. He knows much more back then than scholars know today. And according to the early church, i.e. Arrhenius, this group of Nicolaitans followed Nicholas, who was one of the seven. From the blood-bought, spirit-filled church of God, a minister, a man serving the church and the apostles had prayed for and laid their hands upon, a man who was full of the Holy Ghost and honor support and wisdom, this same man started bringing disciples to follow him. And they came up with a sect known as the Nicolaitans, looking to Nicholas. And their deeds, this church in Ephesus hated, and so did Jesus Christ. He hated their deeds. Once again, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Lord hated their deeds as well. Why did they commit deeds the Lord hated for? In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, I believe it is. I'm using a new Bible. I knew where it was on the page in my older Bible. Revelation chapter of the doctrine of the Galatians. Chapter 2, verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 15. Thank you, son. Chapter 2, verse 15. So hast thou also then to hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Why do they hate their deeds? Because their doctrine. The doctrines the Nicolaitans believed in, the doctrines the Nicolaitans held fast to, caused them to do deeds the Lord hated. What kind of deeds does the Lord hate? In the book of Malachi, we see one such deed the Lord hates. That is your last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Lord says that he hates the putting away of wives, which we would call today divorce. Malachi chapter 2. Verse 14 through 16. Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been a witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is, thy, is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. 
and did not he make one? Yet he had the res of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that I might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of use. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, that is, putting away of wives. For one covered the violence of his garment, and the Lord of hosts, therefore, saith the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit, that you deal not treacherously. Divorce comes from where? Men not loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Divorce comes from where? When men start treating their wives bad. The word of God is so perfect. The more you do, the better it gets. The more you, there's no end to God's word. If you obey God's word and husbands love your wives, Christ so loved the church, your wife will naturally obey and the word of God and submit to you. And when the wife submits to her husband, that causes husband to love her even more. And when the husband loves his wife even more, that causes the wife to submit even more. And when the wife submits even more, it causes the husband to love her more, and it just goes around and around and around and around, and it gets better and better every time. That's God's word. The more you do God's word, the more blessed it is. The more you do of God's word, the more blessed it is. I've been married now for the past 27 years, praise the Lord, and our marriage is better than ever. It is as blessed as ever because the more you do God's word, the more blessed it is. And if husbands still not treacherous their wife, meaning they don't, they don't do that kind of stuff, they don't yell at their wives, they don't get mad, they don't deal treacherous with their wives, they love their wives as Christ so loved the church, the wife will submit to them. And when the wife submits to them, the husband loves them even more. And when the husband loves them more, the wife submits to them even more. That's how it is. So divorce comes starting with husband's dealing treacherously with their wives, and then it gets so out of hand, though they made a covenant with the Lord, they break that covenant, and God says he hates it. It's a deed that they hate. When you go back to Arrhenius in the early church, you read about the Nicolaitans. They were believers in divorce and remarriage. They took marriage lightly. No wonder the Lord said he hated their deeds. Sexual sins were big among them. They were adulterers and fornicators, as is written, Revelation chapter 3, before verse 15, where the Lord reproves them for holding them that have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Revelation chapter 2, sorry about that, verse 15 says, So as to also then to hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, things I hate. Verse 14 says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou was there then to hold the doctrine of Balaam, or Balaam, who taught Balak to cast the summits over the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. So as to also then to hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So again, in the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, even those blood-bought redeemed, full of the Holy Ghost, arose up, speaking perverse things, lines in hypocrisy to draw disciples after them. And such doctrines they taught, the Lord hated. And not only hated their doctrines, he hated their deeds. Their deeds hated because their doctrine hated, and the doctrines they believed in produced forth deeds the Lord hated as well, coming from the Spirit-filled, blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. And instead of pointing souls to Jesus and to his words, they started getting souls to look to them. And how many today in the ministry are building their own kingdoms? How many today in the ministries, deceivers, as Christ warned us about, want people looking to them? Especially the advent of social media, people are looking for followers, people are looking for views, and they speak perverse things. Things are not true, maybe half true, maybe they exaggerate the truth, maybe they add to the truth, maybe they tailor the truth in such perverse things they're saying to draw disciples after them because they want followers, they want people to look to them. They want to lead people. They have this hunger for power, to be lords over God's heritage, to have followers, to lead people, that people look up to them 
and draw the disciples away from the Lord, away from the Lord's word, to follow them. This is what the Apostle Paul warned the blood bought church of Ephesus for three years, night and day, without ceasing, with tears. And today it's everywhere. How many have ministries named at their own selves? How many make a big deal they have their own ministry? How many pastors are calling the church their church, the members their members? How many we're seeing today want disciples following them? Today in these last days, how many folks on discipleship, meaning they're making disciples of them? They're going out there to disciple people to be like them. They're getting disciples to follow them. And we're seeing so many today, false deceivers in the name of Jesus Christ to get disciples to follow them, to look to them, to lie, speak perverse things, and make disciples after their own selves. They'll take history, church history, twist it, and lie about it. So what do they do that for? So that people will think that they have the truth, and they will think that they're following the right way. They're everywhere today. People will take the gifts of the Spirit, and they may actually have a gift from the Spirit, because their spirit feel like Nicholas was. And when somebody's full of the Holy Ghost, they have gifts of the Spirit. But they may exalt those gifts of the Spirit so people look at them. And the people looking at them, they take disciples away. Away from God's Word, away from the Lord, to look to them. Building their own kingdoms, building their own ministries, building their own thing, trying to make a name for themselves. And in these last days, they're everywhere. You want to make sure that you listen to somebody that points you to Jesus. That makes you want to follow Jesus more. You want to make sure you listen to somebody that points you to God's Word and makes you study God's Word, dig into God's Word, learn God's Word. Praise the Lord. I just testified today earlier about how a sister in Christ in Hawaii, I had written her an email a few days ago. I wasn't sure how she was going to receive it because the church she's going to at this time uses the corruptions of God's Word. And that's very bad. That's poison. And in warning her about this, and she, of course, was still uses her King James Version, but she keeps her ear open to their references and, and likes to look at it. What did that version say? And what does this version say? Because that's what her church does. That's not a good thing. That's poison. So I warned her about it and gave her a whole historical about the Old Testament. They're using those new versions coming from Rudolf Kittel's Biblia Hebraica, who was anti-Semitic, whose son... Rudolf Kittel's son was tried and found guilty of war crimes and exterminating his own people, the Jewish people, because both Rudolf Kittel and his son Jared Kittel, they believed in replacement theology. The church replaced the Jews, and they corrupted God's word with their anti-Semitism in as well. And all new verses of the Bible use their Biblia Hebraica for their Old Testament. The authorized version uses the Masoretic text. It has been verified that is the Old Testament God uses. This is the only verse in English that comes directly from the Masoretic text. Praise the Lord. Well, then she did take my word for it. If you take my word for anything, you're stupid. She looked it up. That's too unbelievable. There's no way churches are reading an Old Testament or using versions that come from an Old Testament by a Jewish traitor who became anti-Semitic, whose son was trying to convict her for war crimes. There's no way that's true. She looked it up, found us all true, and said, I'll never reference any other version of the Bible except the King James Version. Praise the Lord. That's what blesses us. You don't believe what I say, you look it up yourself. You search the scriptures yourself. If I provoke a person to dig in the Bible, whether they agree with me, don't agree with me, that's not my thing. If they're digging in the scriptures and they're looking at the scriptures themselves, my job is done. They're now in God's hand. And if they can't hear what thus saith the word of God, they have a problem with God, not me. That's what I'll take this ministry personal. That's what I'll get offended with people. That's why people don't drive me crazy or things like that, because they have an issue with God, not me. I'm not making disciples of me. I'm pointing them to Jesus Christ. And they can choose to be a disciple of the Lord or not. That's their choice. That's between God and them. I just do my part. Our parts appoint people to Jesus. 
Our part, our part is to point people to the Word of God. Well, what do you do, brother? And they get saved. What church are you taking to? That's the Lord's job. God didn't call us to clean the fish. He called us to catch the fish. Once we catch them, they're the Lord's. The Lord will take care of them. We don't have to. We just catch fish. We're just fishers of men. He cleans them. He takes care of them. We just catch them. We do our part. God does his part. One man soweth. Another man, one man planteth. Another man watereth. But God giveth the increase. It's all in God's hands. We labor together with the Lord. We're not doing things in God's stead. We're not doing things in the place of God. We labor with the living God. We do our part. He does his part. And our part is to point people to the Lord. Our part is to get people in his word. That's our part. We don't draw away disciples after ourselves. We don't want people looking to us. If you're looking to me, I will tell you, you are a loser because losers focus on winners. Winners focus on winning. We're focused on heaven. We're focused on serving the Lord. If you're not focused on the Lord, you're out. You've lost. Don't be looking to us. You need to be looking to the Lord and serving the Lord. Once again, in these last days, these false deceivers, just like we see here in the Word of God, they come from the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. They may even be spirit-filled, but they speak perverse things, lies and hypocrisy to draw away disciples after them. They don't want to be questioned. They want to rule over Bill's lives. They don't want to be lords over God's heritage. They don't want to be questioned. They want to rule over people's lives and take the place of God, just like Nicholas did there in the Nicolaitans. And to do so, you can't preach what thus say the Lord. You can't preach that straight gate and narrow way You've got to preach things that people want to hear. If you want to follow Nicholas' example and have a group after you call the Nicolites, you've got to preach things that are seeker sensitive. You've got to preach things that sinners want to hear. And we'll continue there next time from the Word of God of what these deceivers like Nicholas, they teach in their doctrines to sinners. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. As thou hast magnified the word above all of thy name, sanctify it with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.